All right, then let's get into today's agenda. So it is my pleasure to introduce Mark Franmeyer, uh, who I met some years ago at a workshop on, how did we call it? It was like light duty, low emission vehicles, something like this that was in Berkeley. And uh, Mark is a, um, a, a clean technology entrepreneur and also a, a software uh, developer engineer entrepreneur. Um, if I recall correctly, he is a native of, I think, the Eugene, Oregon area. Am I remembering that right, Mark? That's correct. Yeah, grew up here in Eugene and then uh, went to Cal and, and came back to make video games. So, yeah. Corey so, Hall victim. Yes. Spent, uh, I've got fun Corey Hall stories. <laughs> Walking out after an all nighter at six in the morning to see my, my handlebars on my bicycle had been stolen. The rest of the bike was there, but like handlebars turns out are a critical element, not just to that bike, but to the Arkhamoto story. So, you know, things come full circle. So warm, warm, warm stories about the Cal experience and getting lost in Corey Hall. Um, uh, and uh, spent some time in the, uh, in, in the video game industry, uh, working at Dynamics, which uh, we perhaps might hear about. And then I, uh, he, he left and then, started uh, a company called Garage Games, um, and then decided to switch gears in some sense and work in uh, electric transportation where Mark has founded a super fascinating company called Arkimoto uh, with a vehicle that I think is a lot of fun. Um, and so do certain celebrities who I know are quite big fans of, of, of the vehicle. And, uh, and it's been really actually fun for me personally, just following you on Twitter, Mark, and, and Arkimoto to see how the company has evolved. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you. And, um, and then I think after you'll talk, we'll, we'll do some Q&A. Is that right? Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I figured, uh, so, so I, I'm going to play you a, a short video that's sort of like the, where, where are we now? Uh, and then I'll, I'll bring up some slides and do a, 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 a rambling diatribe on how I got here, uh, which is a odd, very odd story, but, uh, and then just open it up to questions and, and we can, uh, we can see where the conversation goes. Sound good? Yeah. Thank you. All right. So this is, uh, this is Arkimoto now. Arkimoto. We build rides, light, electric, ultra efficient rides that are outrageously fun to drive because getting this with this is nuts. We build Arkimoto's for people and for delivery and for people who help people. We're a public company because we have a public mission and we invite you to join us. I'm Mark. In 2007, I went looking for something that didn't exist because then and now we drive crazy big, multi-ton extractive rigs for all the simple trips times everyone. We pave over half the city gridlocked around a world on fire. I wanted a light footprint electric vehicle, affordable, fun, and dialed for the everyday. I couldn't find it. And thus, Arkimoto, and a new platform for mobility. Twin electric motor front wheel drive with a burly battery and a powertrain that sips electrons. We launched production of our flagship product, the fun utility vehicle in 2019. And from the response, we believe it lives up to the name. <laughs> Everybody wants it when they see it, and they haven't even driven it yet. The real joy is when you get to drive it, and then you just get the feeling of what it's all about. Hey, Mark, what's up, buddy? I uh, just want to let you know how much I am enjoying my amazing Arkhamoto. It is an absolute blast. Uh, people are chasing me down in the neighborhood to see it. Let me guess, you want one? <laughs> I'm gonna buy shares. <laughs> right on. <laughs> At the onset of the pandemic, we launched the Deliberator to bring the benefits of Arkimoto's platform to last mile delivery of essential food and goods. The Deliverator's spacious storage suits a wide variety of fleet uses. Its svelte form maneuvers through traffic with ease and parks in spaces no full-size vehicle can. Saving fleet operators precious time means money that flows directly to the bottom line. And we launched the Rapid Responder, 
to help those on the front lines achieve their missions more quickly. I think that the Arkimoto is the perfect vehicle to implement in our city. It's lighter, it's more efficient, it's quicker. Um, there's the cost savings that are associated with it in terms of sustainability, maintenance. I see this as a daily deployed apparatus. How come the cops aren't using one of these? Finally, we announced the Roadster, Arkimoto's premium entry into the established class of pure on-road fun machines. We sell direct. Arkimoto adopters place pre-orders and configure options on the website, and vehicles are delivered directly to our customers. The curious can enjoy the Arkimoto driving experience at our rental centers, the first of which is now open in Key West. Our rental-first model turns what is normally a costly hurdle to brand awareness into a revenue stream, and our partnership with HireCar aims to provide a similar model for gig deliverator drivers. Every Arkimoto is built here at our factory in Oregon, the AMP, where we transform raw material through part cutting, forming, welding, machining, and final assembly all under one roof. With the growing demand for alternative personal transportation around the world, highlighted by our thousands of FUV pre-orders, the seismic shift towards home delivery of food and goods, and over 50,000 fire stations in North America alone, we believe Arkimoto is poised for expansive growth. Meeting this demand through mass production is now our primary goal. And that's why our new collaboration with Detroit legend Sandy Monroe is so exciting. The idea of scaling up production into the 50,000 plus units per year realm, what is your level of confidence that this collaboration will be able to pull that off? I'm totally confident. I think three-wheel vehicles are gonna be more popular than almost anything. As long as we can hit the right target price, and that's what we're doing. Quite frankly, you should have no problem hitting all those targets that, that you're looking to hit. With the Monroe team's help, we aim to prove our model can scale and this venture can go global. Arkimoto is and always has been powered by a community of stakeholders with whom we share a vision of sustainable transportation, clean skies, and a future that's a whole lot more fun. We hope you'll join us. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> so that's that's the uh, that's that's where we are now. Um, it, it has been a, a long and interesting road to get here, and we've, we've certainly got a, a, a quite an interesting path ahead. Um, so uh, as Scott mentioned, I, I, or as I mentioned, but went to Cal, uh, uh, gosh, wow, a while back, 24 years ago, graduated in 96. Um, and I, 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 I was in EECS, um, uh, which then had multiple options, and the path I chose was Totally software. I uh, my my one double E class was EE forty um, that I made the mistake of of taking at eight in the morning and uh, you know barely squeaked through uh, that one. Had to learn a lot about transistors on the final exam uh, from the the notes that I'd taken. But I was quite confident at that point that I would never do a hardware project because I was a software guy. So why bother? Um, be careful uh, what what limits you put on yourself uh, early on. Um, I was also a, one of the reasons I thought I wasn't going to go into hardware is I was a General Motors scholar when I was at Cal, and so I had the uh, the pleasure of of working for GM subsidiaries um, over uh, over the summers uh, in between my my freshman and sophomore years, and from that I I I quite vehemently said I would never go into the automotive business. So. Um, you know, two strikes against me. Um, what I was confident I was going to do was make video games. So um, after I uh, after I left Cal, I went came back here to Eugene, worked for Dynamics um, on on core video game technology. So um, in in the game world, my background is both on you know kind of the, the heavy lifting on the engine side, graphics, network programming. Um, scripting language design, 
uh, and then also on gameplay. So I, I, I was uh, the lead programmer on Tribes and Tribes 2, which if you're not familiar, um, those were kind of the, the precursors to games like Battlefield and Fortnite um, today. We, were, we, we made the sort of the first um, indoor, outdoor, massive scale team, uh, team action game. And yeah, you know, I, I learned a lot making games in the corporate game world. Um, you know, one was uh, one thing was that I, that I learned was that it, it really wasn't actually very fun uh, to to make games with a giant team of people over multiple years. You know, went through uh, burnout cycles and lots of crunch time. Um, and and uh, what a lot of us uh, at the at, at Dynamics would would talk about occasionally was. Uh, you know, sort of the good old days of game development when you could have a small team of five or seven people working for a year and make a really fun game. Um, and so that was that was really the 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 impetus to create uh, garage games was just the experience of um, working on giant big budget games and noticing that you know if. If you think about games today, you could have a, a, an artist that does you know sort of nothing but the textures on the bottoms of the shoes of all the characters, uh, versus the the fun part of of making a game, which is you know really telling a story and building truly compelling gameplay. So Garage Games was intended to uh, be sort of the uh, the the indie store for uh, for independent game developers. At the time that we started, if you wanted to license a commercial game engine, um, it was hundreds of thousands of dollars to license the Unreal Engine or the Quake Engine. Um, and so we thought, you know, let's build a, a AAA caliber game engine and sell it for a hundred bucks. Full source code, no, no glass ceiling that you can't get through. Um, and, and that's what we did. So we, we basically took uh, the technology that we had developed for Tribes and Tribes 2 and made it available under a, a, a fairly open source license, built a whole community around it, started building our own games. And that's really when I, I, I glommed onto the idea that, that really what was essential uh, in game development was to get to core gameplay that really worked and then build sort of the minimal game around it that would allow it to be a, a commercial uh, success in the marketplace. And probably the, the best well-known game that we did at Garage Games was a game called Marvel Blast, where we, uh, you know, I, I spent maybe five months really honing the, a physics model for a rolling sphere, and then we added a starting point and an end point and a timer, and, and that was a game. Um, and that ended up uh, getting bundled onto uh, for a couple of years, it was on every consumer Mac. Um, it was one of the launch titles for Xbox Live Arcade on the Xbox 360. Uh, and between the games that we did and the technology we did, we drew the attention of uh, a company called IAC. Um, that was a, a it's a holding company for technology plays. I think they own Match.com and a bunch of other uh, properties, and they wanted to get into games. And we sort of had all the pieces. Uh, in terms of technology, community of developers, games, uh, and web tech uh, for them to, to build out a, a, a site called Instant Action. So got, got acquired in 2007. And that was, uh, you know, for me, I, I was, I'd started a company with uh, three other guys and they were all, um, you know, sort of uh, older, a little bit more conservative, had families, um, and and were were very uh, excited about the idea of um, of cashing out. And I think um, for me, it, it presented sort of more of a problem than a solution. I mean, I, I knew how to uh, I knew how to write code and I knew how to make games, but I didn't really have any idea what to do with money. Um, although I, I knew that there was a big a big set of problems that the world was facing. You know, growing up in Eugene, Oregon, you have uh, it's the the uh, environmental awareness is is sort of baked into the culture here, um, and it was so. So Eugene is a very bike friendly town. Uh, there are 
transportation futurists who have made some very cool uh, concept vehicles here over, over decades. Um, and so that was in sort of in the water um, as, as I was looking around for next things to do. Um, and at the time I was a bicycle commuter. So I was, uh, but, but I'd also just gotten a house. So I, I, I felt the need for uh, a, a slightly more sedentary powered transportation, but I didn't want a full size car. So I actually went out looking for something to buy. Um, you know, because, because what, we, what we typically drive uh, in, in the, certainly in the Western world, uh, to do daily trips are cars. And cars are amazing. I mean, if you think about the, the Rube Goldberg machine that is the internal combustion engine, it's, it's really truly magical that it actually works at all. Um, but the, the idea that we use 4,000 pounds of steel plus a super inefficient drivetrain to carry one person a few miles to go get a cup of coffee is just insane. Um, and so, uh, and when you, when you multiply that times all of us, um, they, I think the, the statistic is that right around 40%, 40 to 50% of the urban landscape is covered in concrete and asphalt for moving and warehousing cars. And yet we've got gridlock in nearly every major metropolitan area around the planet. So that, that, there's that, that, that whole disconnect was, was really weighing on me um, when, I, when, when I exited Garage Games and went looking for a new ride. So um, what, what, I, what I came to learn later, uh, so for those of, of an entrepreneurial bent, um, there is a, a, a theory called disruption theory uh, that was popularized by a guy named Clayton Christensen in a book called The Innovator's Dilemma. And if, you're, if you pay attention to Silicon Valley, well, I mean, everything is disruptive, but, but disruption theory itself has a very particular definition. And a disruptor in the, in, the, uh, in the Christensen sense is a product that meets the utility threshold for a market. So it meets what a market actually needs, but it does so at a radically lower cost. So if you think about um, you know, the, the reason why Google Docs is a disruptor for uh, Microsoft Word is that it does what people actually need from a word processor, but it's free, uh, where Word costs, you know, at that time, hundreds of dollars. So uh, the, 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 the other sort of canonical example of disruptor, uh, disruption going way back is when Toyota entered the U.S. market. Uh, when Toyota came in, they came in with, with uh, two products, the Camry and the Corona. Uh, the Camry was intended to compete with the top-level offerings of Ford and GM, and it was a failure. Um, they, they, they just couldn't compete toe-to-toe -to -toe with the incumbent players. Because if you're an existing market player, uh, then you are playing the sustaining innovation game. If you're Intel, then every you know, 12 to 18 months, you come up with another chip. It's a little bit more expensive. It's faster. It does more things. Uh, and so you're adding more bells and whistles and more features and moving up that cost curve. What the disruptor does is the disruptor comes in and, and you can see that on this graph is the, that utility threshold is the performance that customers can actually use, right? So the chips keep getting faster but the vast majority of people using computers aren't using that horsepower. So the, the disruptor comes in and says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come in and meet that utility need at a much lower cost. And that's what the Corona was, is it was a, a much lower performance vehicle, but it was super inexpensive. And it allowed uh, both existing market customers to get a lower cost solution and it allowed people who weren't participating in the market at all to actually get into the, uh, a vehicle. And that was what let them establish a foothold in the market. They, at first, were just taking away customers that were super low value to the existing incumbents. And so it wasn't, they weren't perceived as a threat. But because they had a fundamentally lower cost structure, they were able to slowly move up market uh, over successive generations and ultimately become 
uh, the most successful automotive company in the world until Tesla. Uh, I didn't learn about disruption theory until you know, maybe uh, four years into the Arkimoto experience. But what I recognized as soon as I heard it was that that, that was sort of naturally what I have been inclined to do throughout my career. So with, with Garage Games, we, we came in with an engine that was radically more affordable than other AAA game engines to the point where none of those existing players really thought of it as any kind of a, uh, uh, a real threat. Um, although when you, know, when you look at the game engine world now with Unity and Unreal Engine, those, those were really all just following suit on what Garage Games had done early on. In fact, if you talk to the, the Unity founders, I mean, they were, they were chasing us and then we got acquired and then they just went off like a rocket ship. So uh, lesson learned there. Um, and then same thing on the game side, which is that really finding uh, the core gameplay utility threshold. What, can the, what does the customer really want in terms of fun? And then building it with, at, with a much lower cost structure than a AAA game. Uh, we did it in that case because we wanted to have fun making games. Um, but when, when that mindset is applied to vehicles, uh, that's really sort of what you get with, uh, with the Arkimoto um, development story. So uh, you know, b back in 2007, I had a, a, a pocket full of cash. Um, I had the sense that, I, that starting companies was very easy um, because I had done, you know, sort of, we did a, a, a very easy uh, uh, sort of lifestyle oriented business where we all kicked in 10 grand and then the whole thing sold for a deal of about 50 million bucks. So I, I was left with the um, very incorrect notion that starting companies and, and making them successful was, was an easy thing to do. Uh, I had, uh, and then I had this search for a vehicle that I couldn't find. So I went looking for something that was electric, that was lightweight. I didn't want a full size car. Um, I wanted something that was going to solve my daily transportation problems and I couldn't find it. Um, but what I did find in a parade in Eugene in the, in the, uh, end of summer of 2007 was this vehicle called the buggy. So this is one of those future transportation product ideas that was uh, cooked uh, uh, very near here. A guy by the name of Mark Murphy down in Cresswell, which is about 10 miles south, invented this kit vehicle. And I saw this three of them just ripping by in a parade, giant grins on the faces of the drivers. And that was that really the light bulb moment for me that illuminated the gap between the bike and the car. Um, that it was, it, it was the, really, I think, the first cool-looking three-wheeled vehicle I'd ever seen. Um, and so I got a kit. I cajoled some friends into helping put it together. And that was the beginning of Arkimoto. So uh, we, we sort of realized, like, okay, this isn't really the answer, but it's kind of in the direction of the answer. Um, I thought it would take about six months to get to a viable market-ready product. I was woefully uh, over-enthusiastic. It ended up taking seven years uh, just to get to the right basic idea. So, um, and, and really a lot of what it was, and this is uh, kind of the graph of the, the eight generations of Arkimoto, um, was first really understanding what was the utility threshold of the vehicle market. What did the vehicle market really require uh, and the way that we figured that out was we built prototypes and put them in front of people and gauged their reactions, both in terms of the capabilities of the vehicle, in terms of how they drove. Um, and what we found over the first, really sort of like the first four generations, is that we needed it, we kept needing to add capabilities. So the original assumption was that since most people drive alone, that uh, they would, that, that a one seat vehicle would be sufficient. Uh, so we built a few of those, turned out not so much, um, that even though people drive alone almost all the time, uh, they still really want to be able to have the capability of carrying another passenger with them. Um, and so over the first sort of four or five generations, the vehicle th that we built got heavier and heavier and heavier as we added more and more capabilities. 
and then uh, to, to the point where it, there, it was really not going to be competitive with an electric car. Um, that, that, you know, if, you, if you're building a 2,000 pound three-wheeler that is, uh, you know, got kind of a funky aesthetic, that's not going to uh, be able to survive in a market uh, where the major auto manufacturers are building, you know, 3,500, 4,000 pound fully featured electric cars. And so then the challenge became, how do we deliver that utility threshold in a footprint that's going to let us build a truly disruptive product? And it wasn't until um, the, uh, the winter of 2014 that, that it became clear exactly how to do that. And, and it, the, the funniest thing is, that it really amounted to no breakthrough in uh, battery technology or drivetrain technology or anything like that. It was a matter of ditching the steering wheel. And so where, where the real innovation, uh, the, sort of the most fundamental innovation of the Arkhamoto platform is not in all the cool EV technology that I'm assuming that you guys have been learning about over the course of the last semester, but it's in the basic vehicle packaging architecture. Where do you put the heavy stuff to make for a stable three-wheel vehicle on the road? And how do you package two, I'm 6'4", I'm, I'm, I'm kind of our sizing dummy. How do you package two big guys front and back so that you can sit comfortably on a motorcycle-sized platform? And it ended up that getting rid of, you know, sort of the, we, we, we'd had the philosophy of, of don't reinvent the wheel from the beginning but it ended up that ditching the steering wheel was what let us upright the passengers, shorten the chassis, um, the, the battery carrier became the main structural member of the vehicle, and in one step we lost about 600 pounds and two feet of length, which all of a sudden put us right in the sweet spot of, uh, of, of where we wanted to be over the long haul. So, uh, it's, it's, it's worth noting that the vehicle market is, is big. And, you know, I guess one last thing, and this is really to the title of this slide. Um, if you are considering entrepreneurship uh, and going out and starting your own thing, um, one piece of advice that I would, I would give, actually two, one is, is, is make friends with failure. Um, that you are, you will, uh, we're, we're conditioned up through uh, the scholastic years to always win, to always get the best grade, to always succeed. Um, in entrepreneurship, you will get punched in the face repeatedly by reality. And a lot of it is how well can you listen to those circumstances to adjust your course and do better on the next round. Um, and so it's, you know, the, the Arkhamoto story has really been um, just a, one of, of sort of failing over and over and over and over again, but always making real progress forward towards the goal. And even at every failure point, we just would, we would look around and go, well, well, has anybody else really nailed this problem? Or are we still in a really good spot to go after it? And that was what, uh, you know, th that in combination with um, doing something that we actually believe in was what, what kept the venture moving year after year after year. So, uh, yeah, again, going after a very big market, vehicle market is a multi-trillion dollar market, um, and we're doing it with uh, one platform. So this is uh, what one of our analysts calls multiple shots on goal. Um, if you look at the products that were in that, uh, the We Build Rides uh, video, it's uh, the consumer version is the fun utility vehicle. Uh, deliverator for last mile delivery and for, uh, for general uh, fleet use. And the rapid responder is our emergency services version. Uh, and we just announced the Roadster, which is uh, actually the only Arkhamoto vehicle that, that goes into an already very well established and understood market, which is the, the on-road fun machine. Um, and, but, but all of these are built off of one single platform. Um, and, and actually built on the very same assembly line so that, so that as we aim for much higher scale, all of them are additive towards our scale picture in terms of um, our purchasing power, in terms of our uh, assembly processes and, and all the rest. So, um, 
uh, we are not a Bay Area startup. Uh, there is a big difference between starting a, a new technology company in Eugene, Oregon, and some, somewhere within 20 miles of Sand Hill Road. Uh, and so by necessity, we have had to be incredibly efficient with cash. Um, and that has really guided not just our development process, but also how we think about uh, the, the, how, how we will enter the market and how we will scale within the market. So um, that's what led us to uh, our initial customer experience model being rental, where if you want to test drive one, you can actually uh, pay for that privilege versus us opening up stores or selling through dealer franchises. Uh, the latter, which will take a piece of, of the margin, and the former is just an ongoing uh, op, OPEX and CAPEX burn for, uh, for, for the duration of the company. Um, and then same thing with uh, utilizing existing, you know, really utilizing as much existing infrastructure for delivery, for service, um, as we possibly can to keep all of our focus on scaling up production and meeting the demand of the marketplace. So the, the other piece of the strategy is, you know, we've, we've definitely looked at um, the one significant uh, real success story in electric vehicles, which is Tesla. And what Elon has made clear repeatedly is that the product is only one piece of the puzzle, that the real product is, is, is actually the factory that builds the products. And so we are taking a, a very similar approach as we look to scale, which is that we're designing both the mass production version of the vehicle platform and the factory that builds those with the idea that we are going to copy paste that factory design uh, all over the world where it makes sense for Arkhamoto vehicles to go into market. And then, you know, if, if you're following transportation, there's, you know, we see this real intersection of lightweight, electric vehicles and autonomous driving technology. Um, we have stayed very focused on the actual vehicle side of that. So the vehicle platform architecture, the scale production processes. But we are very much intending that this platform be really an ideal platform for any number of different uh, organizations that are going after the sensor and software stack. So we see the Arkimoto as really being a common platform for autonomy that can host any number of different technologies depending on the particular use cases. Um, and with that, that's, that concludes my prepared remarks and slideshow. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the share and uh, stop there and open it up to questions. Beautiful. Um, I was actually thinking to ask you some background questions and then and then open open it up just to kind of dig more right. into you, Mark. Right away. Um, so you you grew up in Eugene, Oregon, and you mentioned that um, uh, sustainability is built in into the culture. T tell us about you as a kid. What were you like as a kid, and and how did that inform? Well, you know, who you are today. You know, I really I I was I I. I pretty super introverted. Um, I actually grew up in a very political family. So my dad was the, uh, I, I was born into his first campaign for the state legislature. He was the Oregon's attorney general for 11 years, uh, then the president of the University of Oregon. So I was, I always had um, the, uh, the, the computer was sort of my refuge. Uh, and that's, I, I, I'm a self-taught programmer uh, from I got an Apple II when I was seven, and you know learned basic, then assembly language. Um, my cousin uh, actually went through Berkeley, uh, Berkeley's CS department five years before I did, um, and so on family reunions he would just do the uh, do the brain dump of, uh, of of everything he had learned at Cal in the previous year, and then I would spend the next you know. 12 months just sort of thinking about it. That's why I started programming in C when I was in high school. And then, so by the time I actually got to Berkeley, a lot of it was actually review, strangely enough. Um, and, and, you know, so, so, so spent a lot of time playing video games growing up. Um, 
Also, you know, always very interested in transportation. I can remember back, I would, uh, you know, uh, when I was a young kid, you know, mapping the neighborhood, uh, doing like generating street maps and exploring the town, um, just trying to understand how, uh, how it all fit together. And that, uh, I, I actually, more recently in, in the, in the uh, I think 2011 to 2014, I served on Oregon's Transportation Commission. So I got to experience transportation not just as a vehicle entrepreneur, but as a, from a public planning uh, perspective as well. And just looking at, you know, the uh, really the amazing amount of cash that goes into building our road infrastructure uh, because, you know, we, we don't just burn oil um, getting vehicles down the road. We actually pave the road with oil as well. Um, so it's, it, if worldwide, I think there's something like 45 million miles of roads, which is you know, all, basically halfway to the sun uh, if, you, if you stretch it all out in, in one, uh, one length. Um, and th that infrastructure is, is, is driven by what we drive. Um, I guess other aspects growing up, played a lot of Lego, played with a lot of Legos. That's really my only actual qualification for starting a vehicle company was um, being a Lego builder as a child. Um, I, I, uh, otherwise, it was just coming at it really as a customer. Now, the last 13 years has certainly taught me a lot about mechanical engineering and uh, all of the electrical engineering that I slept through in, uh, in 1993. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if that gives you a little bit of a flavor. Yeah, it does. I was I was actually doing doing my research on you before this, and I wanted to ask you about your father. And you know, he and I understand that he, you know, he, as you mentioned, was a general attorney for the state of Oregon, was president of the University of Oregon for fifteen years, and I understand that um, the notion of law and public service he he maybe inherited from from his father, your grandfather. Uh, do, do you do you find that you know you talked about having a refuge? From the political campaign with a uh, in front of the computer, do, do do you do you feel though that the the notion of public service and you know goes hand in hand with thinking about decarbonizing transportation? Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, and and both both my you know my dad my dad was uh, public service was sort of like in his reality for his entire life, and it, it was for mine as well. My mom was in the Peace Corps. Uh, she yeah. uh, was uh, worked for Children's Services Division, um, and, and in terms of uh, and did you know adoptive long term planning. So uh, public service was just sort of uh, an a, an expected um, piece of the uh, of the puzzle. Like we got a we got a world out there that's got a lot of need, um, and for for people who have that capability to step up, it has always been hammered in. Um, I think when I saw you know growing up. Uh, looking up at my dad and seeing, you know, he was a Rhodes Scholar, you know, Harvard educated, went to Bolt Law School, studied at Oxford, went on to, you know, argue seven cases in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, won six of them. Um, I just looked at, sort of looked at his resume and said, I, you know, I'm, I'm never going to compete with that. Um, so I'm going to need to, you know, sort of chart my own course. And I think that's what, what computers really were for me. And he, he was never, it was funny, it, when, when I was growing up, it was just always like, you know, get off that damn machine until I got a paycheck for it. And he's like, oh, you know, this, this whole, there might be something to this whole computer thing. Uh, but uh, yeah. I have no doubt he, he was incredibly proud. You, you mentioned being on the Oregon Transportation Commission, which I think is fascinating because if I got the year straight, you, you did that while you were... Uh, uh, during Arkhamoto, you yeah. know, in the earlier years. So, so you were in a public service role serving on the Oregon Transportation Commission. Can, can you talk about, I mean, just balancing that, but also did it, did it, how did those two roles kind of affect your perspective in each of those roles? Well, it was, uh, you know, I, I think I was definitely the voice of uh, the futurist on the commission, um, and and the the commission, the Oregon Transportation Commission in Oregon oversees ODOT, 
uh, it, it meets every month and gets you know, the state highway plan up, updates and approves all the projects and, and so on and so forth. Um, I, and so I guess I was always trying to be the voice of you guys can't, if you're planning for a project that's not going to be, that, where, where you're justifying it based on traffic numbers in 2035 to pay for this multi-billion dollar project, you got to be aware that in 2020, 2021, 2022, there is going to be a radical shift in mobility uh, the moment that autonomous vehicles really come online and we, we stop thinking of this single occupant, full-size car as, as the dominant paradigm. That we're gonna, we, we can make much better use of the asphalt that we've already got. And so focusing on expanding lanes right now and making infrastructure investments that aren't ever gonna pay off um, is, uh, is, is we, we got to start thinking about that. And so, um, you know, I, I, I lasted three years. Uh, I think, uh, th that might've been part of it. Um, but, uh, but it was, it was definitely a, a learning experience for me and particularly at a time when, when the, you know, up here, uh, we've got the a, a Cascadia subduction earthquake event that is, you know, going, it's a matter of when, not if. And so really focusing on how do we support the infrastructure that we have versus the ever expansionist mindset about highways. That was really what I tried to echo over and over. But then I also, at the same time, I had to, you know, sort of put up in, in the sense that that was, that was well uh, before Arkimoto had a real viable product. So at the same time that I was, you know, sort of saying, here's where the future is going to be. We were very hard at work trying to make that real. Right. You know, uh, maybe the last question before you open it up is, um, you know, you, you started your career after Cal with, with video games, doing software, and you talked about going into hard tech. And we all hear about an entrepreneurship, um, the fact that if you stay in software, it's easier to scale and there's this uh, on Sand Hill Road, all those investors, uh, their investment models are very much based off the time scales of software. But when it comes to clean tech, um, uh, you know, some folks refer to a lot of it as hard tech. And here you've taken a, a hard right turn and you're saying now, um, I'm going to focus on the vehicle. I'm going to focus on manufacturing and doing that super well. Uh, it seems that there's all these other outside forces on you that would say, you know, including your own, the inertia of your own history saying, don't do that. So um, I find it very inspiring because we need people doing that. So, so tell us about that. Like, did you feel those forces against you? And, and Oh uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, so, so 2007 was a great year to sell a company. 2009 was a horrible year to run out of all the cash that you just, uh, you know, made off with, uh, and go out looking for funding on Sandhill. So I, you know, this was at a time when it looked like Tesla was going to go to zero. It looked like Fisker was going to go to zero. It looked like Coda was going to go to zero. And, you know, uh, the VCs had invested, well, I think literally billions of dollars, um, in, in very speculative vehicle plays. And here I show up, you know, computer game developer from Eugene with a crazy three-wheel vehicle idea asking for cash. I got, I got laughed out of every office. So, um, and, and any number of people have told me over the years, you know, why are you doing a hardware play when you're really good at software? I think for, for a vehicle company, it's a huge advantage to, um, to, uh, to really understand the world of technology and software as a vehicle developer. Um, because even if we're not doing uh, pieces of it ourselves, and we are doing, uh, we have absolutely are doing our own software development, we're just not taking on some of the, you know, very big challenges. We have an implicit understanding of that world in a way that you really wouldn't if you came from a heavy manufacturing background. So um, I've been able to uh, very thankful that I've been able to, to recruit a team of awesome manufacturing uh, and mechanical engineering experts to drive that part of the development process. But then uh, I think it's also been a big advantage 
uh, coming from the world of software and scaling mentality and all the rest um, and applying it to vehicles. And I, I, the only other guy I would point to that, that I've seen do that uh, very successfully is Elon. I mean, he, he came from video games and internet startups to go do rocket ships and electric cars. It can be done. You can make the jump, but uh, it, it does. The, the other thing I, I did, you know, I never thought I was going to be an entrepreneur. That was not a part of my plan. I didn't, I, I didn't ever really, I didn't ever really think about it. It was only when um, uh, Jeff Tunnell, who would come to be my business partner in Garage Games, came to me and said, you know, you need to quit uh, and go start writing a new engine and we're going to give it away. Um, and change the world, that I realized that entrepreneurship is a really amazing vehicle for change. So you know, there, are, there are certain changes that you can make by being a political activist. Um, there are certain changes that you can make in the nonprofit world, but there are a whole set of changes that are really best accomplished by starting a company to make a new kind of product. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's really what drew me into entrepreneurship was um, just aiming for a, a change that I thought really needed to happen. Fascinating. I'm really curious to hear what the students have to ask and what Jack has to ask. So All right. let's open it up. Yeah. You, you can, uh, let's see, how do we do this? Um, you can raise your hand in the participant window or just unmute and ask or drop a chat, whatever is most comfortable for you. Oh, wow, they're all popping up. Uh, let's go with Harshita. Thank Different. you so much. This is such a great presentation. I have a question. So how did you find the right team to build Archimodo? Because it was kind of a concept that didn't exist. So you'd need to have a, sort of a forward-looking team in order, both on the hardware, the software, and the market side of things to, to really propel this vision. So how did you go about finding the right team? Did you recruit them through your network? Um, did you like set up a set up a Google form? Did you rely on your on your fellow Berkeley alums? You know, I I am I I wish I could take credit of any kind for building this team, um, but the reality is that almost everybody who uh, as you know certainly in the early years, um, but but even even afterwards, even much more recently. Uh, almost everybody that has jumped on board is, has come to the company saying, I want to be a part of this story. They would just, some, sometimes they would just show up and say, look, you don't have to pay me, um, but I, I've got some skills that I think will help this thing succeed. And, you know, this is you know, way back in the day. So I'm just going to show up here every day and I will, uh, you know, grind on prototypes or give you advice on drivetrains or whatever. Um, and so I think for me, what, what that really said is that it, the, the key, at least, at least for, for me, has been clearly articulating a mission that resonates with people. Um, and that, that if you've got the right mission, uh, it will draw the people that will help make that a success. Now, I think I could also really do better at being proactive, and I think what we're doing right now, obviously, now we're you know, 130 people. We have an HR department that's out there scouring for the right uh, fits for the various roles in the team. Actually, hiring has become uh, one of our uh, key disciplines, um, is, is finding people to fill the seats as we go to scale that will really help us uh, get to the major next level. But early on, I mean, people would just show up saying, I want to be a part of this crazy idea. Um, and that was largely, it was, it, was, it was a largely a volunteer force in terms of people saying, you know, I want to be a part of this thing. Thank you so much. And also you're really selling Eugene, Oregon pretty hard <laughs> to all of us. Well, it's a, it's a fun little hippie town. Rains a lot, but, you know, good people. Uh, Jack mentioned he had questions actually earlier on, so uh, let's go to Jack. Uh, thanks, thanks for your excellent uh, presentation, Mark. I, I listened diligently. Um, so let me ask you about regulatory uh, stuff briefly, because 
part of the problem in the Netherlands with electric vehicles is the licensing because there they consider any vehicle that's not pedal powered to require a license and insurance. In, this, in the States, I'm not sure how your vehicle is classified. Is it classified it's a, as a- It's a motorcycle. All, all three wheelers in the US are motorcycles. Okay. Has anyone thought about changing? And that's a prohibitive thing because in California, you have to have an actual riding test, which is not easy. Has anyone no, thought about- let California, California's got, so all actually 49, I think 49 out of 50 states now have some kind of a carve out for three wheel vehicles that let you drive them with a normal driver's license. And California is one of those states. So in California, you can drive an Arkimoto without getting a special license. Um, in uh, what, what we're doing from a, on, on the lobbying end is in the states where you do need a motorcycle endorsement, first, a lot of those states uh, have, a, have a special three-wheel endorsement where you don't have to retake the skill test. You just have to take the knowledge test again. Um, so it's, it's an easier hurdle. But still, you know, the Arkimoto takes about 15 to 30 seconds to learn how to operate. It's super intuitive. Um, and so the idea that you should need a special license to drive it is a, it's an unnecessary burden to our customers. Um, so we're just basically going down the list of states uh, that in, in order of the size of pre-orders that we've got. Um, and cause, because like about 70% about of our pre-orders come from just 10 states. So we're, we're, we're uh, and, and we found actually quite receptive audiences on the legislative side saying, oh yeah, we have carbon goals, we have affordable electric vehicle goals, this thing is awesome, let's make sure people in this state can use it. So. Uh, when I spoke to uh, Fisker, you probably know Henrik. I don't know if you know him, but I, I, I've met him uh, on a couple of occasions, but I wouldn't say that I, I know him well. I cer certainly he's right. been uh, yeah. we've, we've been peers in this space now for for a good number of years. Part of the revenue stream is these things called carbon credits in California. Is that part of your balance sheet in Oregon? I don't know whether Oregon has that type of infrastructure. Not not presently. Um, we are, and, and the most of the carbon, uh, the carbon crediting uh, regime is focused on cars, uh, not, not motorcycle class vehicles. So that's another area of public policy that we see an opportunity in. Um, but Arkimoto was really conceived as what, what if we never got any incentives at all, could we build a successful, profitable business doing that? Now, I, I think we can. I think it would be, I think there are a lot of really good um, reasons why the public sector should be very supportive of what we're doing uh, because it will make it go faster in the achievement of the goals that they've laid, laid out. And I think ultimately what every uh, customer, consumer in America deserves is a, a level playing field amongst the options. Um, but. Uh, but, but it's, it's not a part of our story today. So, well, I mean, what's, what, what's hard for them to get at their header? If you added another wheel, you had two wheels in the, in the rear, it's no longer a motorcycle, is that correct? correct. But that's just a, a semantics, really. I mean, what, isn't there, wouldn't, couldn't there, I mean, policy-wise, couldn't there be a special classification for low-powered electric vehicles? Absolutely. And, yeah, because just adding a, another wheel would make it more stable. Uh, I don't it, know about well, well the, the real magic of the Arkimoto platform is that it is a very stable three wheel platform. So it is that's that's really the uh, that's what eight generations of design and development got to is a is a very stable, lightweight three wheel platform. Adding a fourth wheel, I think, would make it worse. Um, you, you suddenly get uh, you get a lot more torsional flex on the chassis because, you know, three points are always on a plane. Uh, whereas if you've got a fourth, it's always out of plane and it's always twisting the chassis, which then means you are adding, you're adding weight for the suspension and wheel of that fourth wheel. You're adding weight to the chassis for rigidity. Um, what, what the Arkimoto platform brings and from a driving dynamic standpoint, dual motor front wheel drive with four, a four biased and very low center of gravity just is a really awesome driving experience. Uh, so it really is intended to be a three-wheel platform, and three is really all you need for the types of trips 
that the Arkhamoto platform is very good at. Here's a, do you have heated grips on it? Absolutely. Heated oh, grips, heated, heated seats. Heated seats. Very good. Um, the other question, uh, you know, you mentioned the dual motor. The first thing I clicked on, because I have experience here, is traction control. And I bet you're doing that in software. Is that correct? That, that's that, Right now, the, the, what, what we have is really basically just a, a pretty dumb uh, software differential based on yeah. steering angle. But full torque vectoring is on the roadmap. Uh, where, where we'll do, and the, the real advantage of having that done through the motors is versus the, the braking system is it's just going to provide a much smoother traction control experience. If you've ever had your traction control kick in when you're driving a, a gas car, it's a, actually a pretty jarring experience. Same thing with anti-lock brakes. So having it be on, done in the inverters um, with, with the motors is actually, it, it's just a much more responsive system. And I take it you have dynamic braking and inertial recovery and those kinds of things. We talked about that. Yeah, so, so regen braking, actually one of, the, one of the cool aspects of the controls of the Arkhamoto is that you have a regen control um, that is separate from the standard brake control. So you, can, you, you have a variable rate regen that you have full control over. And, and what you end up doing is using that almost exclusively for slowing down. And I know looking at it that it has motorcycle handlebars kind of like that. So that means you can't go one full rotation. You get probably 80 to 70 degrees or so, or how much yeah. rotation, 100, 100 and yeah, it's, 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 it's about 70 it's degrees. Well, 70 degrees lock to lock. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. how do you manage that? Because that would entail a quick turning because I had the problem here is like we didn't have a, a steering box, a geared steering box or rack and pinion. And when you turn it, it turns really, really quickly, like scary fast turning. Uh, yeah, it, it really is. It's, you know, so if you if you have them wide out, so you've got a, f a fair bit of movement. Uh, oh, I see. Right. Yeah. Um, and then we have a power steer unit uh, that that tapers off as you get to speed. So oh. it, it and, and then there is I mean, there's some amount of, of sort of just in, in terms of the way that the wheels are angled so that it, it is, uh, it, it, it's not super, um, super finicky when you're, when you're going fast. It actually feels really, really solid. The, the throttle is on the grip, is that correct? Yes, the throttle yeah, twist the throttle um, and then finger a trigger regen and foot brake. Foot brake, okay. And, and, and a reverse is, a, is a, on the steering wheel? It's it's on it's it's on your on your same throttle side, so you can really you can control the vehicle pretty much with one hand. That's very cool. We tried to do that. It wasn't it didn't work all that well here. It's, we're behind you guys, but it's something we built it, for fun. It it was to get the controls really dialed in uh, was hard. a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. You don't realize that the ergonomics and the feel. People have to feel comfortable when they're on it. And, and that's still, it's still a moving target for us. I mean, I think we're going to continue to make improvements in both ergonomics and control interface and feel um, really at least for uh, you know, the next several years to come. Excellent. Uh, and, and kilowatt hours on the battery, I guess that's a trade secret? 19.2 uh, kilowatt hours. Oh, that's a lot for a lightweight vehicle. Yeah, so it gives us 102 miles of city range. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. So that's that's on the order of five, I'm just doing the math in my head, five miles per kilowatt hour. And a typical EV is, isn't it more like uh, three or four? Yeah. And I, I think we're gonna eventually get down to the point where the, the, the target's to get it to 150 watt hours a mile. So um, we, we've got a ways to go. That'll, that would give us the, equivalent, you know, 230 miles per gallon equivalent, we're at 173.7. So we're going to see continued uh, improvements in drivetrain efficiency, uh, continued light weighting, continued aerodynamic improvements over time. But, you know, 173 miles per gallon equivalents, not a bad starting point. Not at all. One more question. Sorry, if I ain't taking all the time here. Have you ever thought about building a hybrid, a serial hybrid? Uh, we, we, we definitely thought about it. Um, but getting, you know, there, there are a couple of considerations there. One is that, um, you, it's a, it's a substantially more significant development project. 
there are a whole host of emissions regulations that would have to be dealt with uh, to actually get into market. And ultimately, my thought was that by the time that we actually get that product done and in market and scaled up, that we would have been better off just letting battery technology work its course and get us uh, more energy density on the battery side. All right, Sam. Thanks uh, so much for being here with us. This is really, really cool to hear about everything. Um, I was wondering what the biggest challenge is that you guys are having in terms of meeting demand in manufacturing. Like what, what is the biggest hurdle that you guys have to go over right now? Right, right, right now, the biggest challenge is, is supply chain. So we've had uh, hiccups in, um, and probably the biggest pain point is plastics manufacturer. Um, so our, our plastic supplier for our vacuum form body panels, uh, I think has had a tough time with the pandemic um, and just meeting uh, our scale up needs. So that's one of the reasons why we are vertically integrating plastics manufacturer. We've we actually got a fully automated uh, vacuum forming cell that's gonna come online next quarter to help us uh, help us meet that, um, you know, get, get over that bottleneck. But it's also, I mean, it's been uh, windshields and chargers and, you know, washers of all things. Um, you know, any, any missing piece uh, stops the production line and you can't finish a vehicle and get it out the door. The other aspect that we've been uh, dealing with, which any new EV program deals with, is just the inevitable bugs that crop up once you have 150 vehicles on the road that you just don't catch in the, in the testing process. And so I think we've had on the order of a dozen recalls um, that, that we have uh, fired off over the last year um, that, uh, that has necessitated you know, fixing vehicles in the field and then reworking vehicles on the production line my expectation is that our, our quality uh, recall type issues and our supplier bottlenecks will largely be alleviated in the early part of next year. And a secondary question, sorry, I'm kind of more on the business side than on the technical engineering side. Um, I noticed that um, your, the stock price kind of doubled within like the last, the last 30 days. Oh, it did? Is there any really? Wow. <laughs> I was wondering if that was for any reason in particular. Uh, well, I, I think it's because I played the banjo during the earnings call, but it <laughs> could be, we did a fairly unconventional, in fact, unprecedented ending of our earnings call. And then the stock went up 70% two days later. Uh, might be connected to that. Probably not. My, my, and, and again, I'm not a financial analyst, so uh, don't take anything I say as actual market gospel. But if you've been following EV stocks generally, um, there has been a, a, a huge lift across the board in a, a bunch of the new SPAC plays. So this would be things like, um, you know, uh, 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 Nikola and uh, Fisker's company. And uh, I mean, there's been a whole host of these electric vehicle SPAC plays. Uh, and then the election happened and we get an incoming Biden administration, which is looking like it will be very favorable towards electric vehicles. Uh, and then we had a really a blowout uh, third quarter that we talked about at the beginning of that, that particular week where it really went on a rocket ship. We launched uh, the Roadster, which is a significant uh, piece of our product portfolio. And then we announced a pilot agreement with the city of Orlando which is really the first municipal kind of validation of, uh, of the product family. And so all that hit at the very same time and just sent the stock to the moon. I, I think it got up to $20 and 20 cents. And this is from a low of 97 cents in March. So Arkimoto got up to 20 X plus in the span of, you know, seven months, which, um, was, was pretty fascinating to see. It's obviously, pulled back a little bit since then, 
but we took advantage of the climb in the stock to do two capital raises, uh, like one after another, one at 13 and a quarter, one at 15 and a quarter. And I think that's also going to help really stabilize uh, the, new, the new price. Yeah. Also, what is this that we're hearing about Elon Musk having crashed one of the vehicles yeah. last year? <laughs> so so he, uh, he, he actually is the very, he's the very first person to crash a production Arkimoto. And this was uh, in Oct- early October of last year. Um, we have a mutual friend, uh, a guy named Adeo, um, who I, I met when I was in the video game industry and he was building a game company. Uh, Adeo was Elon's roommate in college. And so when Adeo got his Arkimoto, he brought it over to Elon's house um, and Elon jumped in it and just gunned the throttle right into a little retaining wall. It's not a big deal, but um, I think it might have, it, it, in, in right after battery day, Elon said something about three wheelers and that was what really sparked uh, the conversation. So if you uh, watch Hyperchange at all. It's uh, Galileo did an interview with me and my mom when he was in Eugene right after Battery Day, and that's when uh, that's when that story came out. Thank you. There, yeah. there it is. No wonder he's making self-driving vehicles that are the safest ones on the planet. Makes makes a lot of sense. <laughs> he's testing on an extreme user. True. Uh, let's go to Alan. But yeah, you just can't make this stuff up. I mean, the, the, the strange anecdotes of Arkimoto, like that's, that's one of them. It's like, really? Elon is the first one to crash an Arkimoto. That's, huh. could not have made it up. For sure, Mark. Thank you for the story too. And thank you for being here with us. Uh, I was gonna ask you about uh, if you're ever gonna make a two-wheeler or is it all specifically just three-wheelers? You know, my, my, I guess both with two wheelers and four wheelers is that there are a lot of people out there making really good products in those realms. Um, I, I, my preference is to do things that other people aren't doing. And so that's what, uh, you know, drove me to do Arkimoto in the first place. Um, I definitely see opportunity in the even more micro mobility space. So what, uh, what, Arkimo, what, what the fun utility vehicle is to an SUV, I see an opportunity in the equivalent of that to an FUV. Um, but uh, but that's, that's down the road. Sounds good. And uh, when we say micro, is it specifically just like two or less people? Is that... uh, micro mobility, as I understand it, is, is a, a vehicle that weighs less than 1,100 pounds. So at, oh, okay. at 1,300 pounds, the FUV is actually just outside of that category. Um, I think further optimizations of the platform uh, and production methodology will get us under 1,100 pounds. So we definitely want the FUV to be in the micromobility world. Um, and then I think we'll, we'll also be able to build something that's, again, an order of magnitude, uh, lighter and more efficient. Okay. And can you... And can you uh... Is there any like uh, off-road or special addition you can have to this Arkimoto? Well, I, I had thought, you know, I, for, for a long time, I thought the way that we were going to do off-road was to make a quad where we took our dual motor drivetrain and just sort of copy pasted it on the back of the vehicle. Uh, it would make a super badass quad. But when I, when I got the Roadster uh, on the road, I actually took it uh, down a, a, a super gnarly alley and I realized that that platform is actually going to make, I think, a really good off-road platform. So I think, it, I, I think that the, the Roadster gives the template to suggest that, that actually we could build an, off-road, an off-roadster, if you will, um, that, yeah, yeah. that is, a, is, a, is a really fun off-road machine uh, that doesn't require us to, to build a fundamentally new platform. It would need to be... Uh, more burly, it would need um, more suspension travel, uh, things like that. But I think uh, it could be done on the same uh, on the same basic vehicle architecture. Nice. So you know, if you're gonna go through it, you're gonna you don't have to take that much time. Cost goes down too. Is yep. That idea. Well, it's really how much? How many different ways can we leverage this one vehicle architecture? True. Uh, and and really get the economy of scale. 
and that's that's just been uh, our our driving thought is like let's you know v- versus making very distinct product lines that have completely different supply chains um, let's let's do a bunch of different products that really are essentially all the same product just aimed at different niches in the market thank you again mark pleasure wonderful trevor Hello, Mark. Thanks for doing this. So um, you talked about like your background in that was heavily in software. So I was wondering, but then it seems like Arkimoto is like kind of a very hardware centric company. So I guess it's like, what kind of software innovations is Arkimoto making? Yeah. Uh, so, so we're, you know, where we need software is really the glue that holds the entire organization and product together. So it's a, it's a lot of system integration getting our, our ERP package to work with the vehicle backend telematics, to work with the app, to work with the website. Um, and then there, there's uh, definitely a lot of software work to do on the, the more microcontroller level for battery management, um, the inverter control, uh, torque vectoring is gonna be a major software program, and then preparing for autonomy, which is really the building the interface um, that the that the sensor and software stack on top uses to actually drive the vehicle. Okay, and then regarding autonomy, so there's like a company out there called Neuro that's yep. already kind of doing the delivery front. So I guess it's like, how are you going to like um, I guess differentiate yourself from? Well. Uh, the, the, so Neuro's building on a four-wheeled platform, that's sort of a neighborhood electric vehicle platform. I think where, where the Arkimoto platform would differ is that the Arkimoto can go on all the roads and it can go full speed. Um, the, the other aspect is that, that it is a, a good people mover. So if you look at our deliverator, I, I look at the deliverator really as kind of the basic unit of autonomy where it can carry one person, about 80% of ride share is just one passenger, and it can also carry a bunch of stuff. So you could have an autonomous people and stuff mover um, that would be distinct from, certainly distinct from Neuro's offering, and would be a much better fit for the road than uh, what Tesla's doing or what Waymo's doing. You know, they're doing full-sized cars, but again, ride share is 80% of the time, it's just one person getting from A to B. So we think that because of that, when we really switch to an autonomous road, that 80% of the vehicles on that road should be aimed at most efficiently moving one person around. And then last question. Um, So what would you regard as like, I guess one of the biggest software innovations that's kind of come out since like you graduated from Cal, like something that uh, so I know C has been around for a long time, but in like, what is like, I guess, one change in computer science that has made things more possible today than it was? I, I to me, I'd, I'd have to say it's, it's the, it's AI. Um, the, the, the advances, I mean, the advances in graphics have been incremental, right? Things have, have certainly gotten more realistic. Um, the, uh, uh, well, I guess probably two would be one is, is, on, on the software side would be all of the work to make uh, touch interfaces really viable platforms. So that, and that's the software that, that fueled, you know, iPhone and, and Android. But what, what's really enabled um, whole new realms of, of uh, computer science and, um, you know, unlocks self-driving vehicles and, uh, and, and all the rest is is AI, um, and the new approaches to artificial intelligence that are you know, ultimately aiming for uh, you know f- full full AI. Watch out, the singularity is coming. All right, thanks. Wonderful. All right, next up, Jarvis. Yeah, uh, can you hear me well? Yep. Yep. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Mark, for the presentation. Um, when I first saw the um, Arkham model, especially the, uh, the, the roaster, uh, it reminds me of the design of um, the player's slingshot, which is also a three-wheeler. 
Um, I've seen one in person, a, a guy driven it was really cool. So I uh, really like the design of the uh, three wheeler kind of concept. Uh, well, my question is kind of um, related to kind of the um, position of the three wheeler you have in mind. So I look at the price it's around like 1100, $11,000 uh, dollars roughly for the um, when we cross the type of when we get to scale, we're targeting eleven thousand nine hundred. Um, the uh, the the intro price right now is seventeen thousand nine hundred for the fun utility vehicle, and the Roadster will have actually a likely a higher initial price uh, than that because the the market that that's going into is, you know, the the Slingshot and the Can Am Spider, which are all in the twenty thousand plus range. I see. Yeah. So I guess my question would be towards kind of the lower cost um, vehicle. Do you have in mind that it will replace some of the uh, maybe ride sharing towards more like a fun utility in the city? Or do you have in mind for uh, for the customer to purchase this just because of fun or, you know, daily uh, weekend drive, um, that sort of thing? I, I think it's really all of the above um, because of where we're aiming for in terms of price. Uh, the, the, the math looks good for vehicle sharing. Once it's uh, got some autonomy capability, it works really well for as a ride sharing, you know, sort of shared ride sharing vehicle. Um, it makes a great vacation destination rental vehicle because it's very fun. Um, that's also what makes it a very good toy purchase. It's a good tow behind vehicle for a motorhome. It's a great vacation home vehicle. It's a very good everyday commuter vehicle. I use it all the time for all of my daily trips. It's an absolute blast. Our early customers love using it um, in, in versus their cars. Uh, and we hear that over and over. Um, it makes for a very good delivery platform for meals, for groceries, um, and for small parcels. Uh, so really it's, and, and it, all you really have to do is just stand on a busy street corner and watch the cars going by. Just, just do that experiment, just stand on What's the one that comes down right by the uh, uh, Sather Gate? It's the, the main Bancroft. Bancroft. Yeah, Bancroft. just stand on Bancroft on the edge. Just watch the cars going down. And what you'll see over and over and over and over and over again is one person with a modest amount of stuff uh, in a 4,000 pound vehicle. And that's, that is, Arkhamoto is not about changing your behavior pattern. It's about building the right tool for the job that people are already doing with cars. Great, that's good to know. Thank you. Thanks. Actually, I'm gonna tack on just a curiosity. I find the, the fleet market really compelling. I'm, I'm curious what percentage of uh, sales right now have been in fleet versus individuals. To date, it's been almost all individual uh, with the exception of our first rental franchise in Key West. Uh, and a few pilot vehicles uh, that we've put out there that are either deliverators or, or fun utility vehicles. I, the, the fleets we see as, as a long term are going to make up a significant portion of Arkhamoto sales, um, but those are longer conversations. The, the sales cycle is typically quite a bit longer, um, and there's much more of a burden of, of, of sort of longevity, service lifetime, um, you know, all, all of the things that a fleet operator is going to want to have comfort on that, and uh, that we, we can't really provide comfort on with the first products out the gate. So that's where the consumer market really helps, right? A, a, a individual can say, I want that thing, write the check, give it to me, you know, take my money. Um, and then that helps us get that longitudinal data that then makes the fleet side of it a viable business as well. It makes a lot of sense. I, I can imagine autonomy will also accelerate the fleet market as well. Absolutely. Uh, Kyle. Uh, yeah, again, uh, thanks for taking the time and uh, spending time with our class. This has been a wonderful talk. I had a couple of questions. Um, the first is how you asked Elon if you wanted to write a statement about the safety of your systems. <laughs> uh, well, no, he, he so, so he, uh, Sandy Monroe, who is working with us on the scale step, did a battery day YouTube video after Tesla's battery day. And of course, a bunch of his predictions for what was gonna be shown at battery day came true. And at the end of that video, he said, 
Te hey, Tesla, if I've got any credit with you guys at all, please do me this favor. I'm working on three three-wheel vehicle projects and we'd like your help. And Elon tweeted out, you know, can't support three wheels, not safe enough. Um, and so that was what was, you know, sort of spurred the conversation with Galileo was, was really what the question of safety, right? Is, um, what is, you know, safety is a spectrum. It runs from uh, the one and two wheel vehicles up to um, Teslas, which are the very safest four wheeled cars on the road. Um, and it, it also, the, the question of safety is not, to me, it's not just about how safe am I as an operator of this vehicle, but how safe am I for everybody else out there in the world? Uh, because if you've got a distracted driver cruising around in 4,000 pounds of steel, uh, reading text messages on the phone, that, that, is, uh, that person may be very safe if they get into an accident, but the person they get into an accident with is going to be in a lot of trouble. So uh, to me, the, the question of safety really ultimately requires us, and I think this is true of the world, right? We, if we are all focused on our own individual creature comforts and making sure that I get mine, um, to the detriment of uh, everybody else and the and the environment around us, then ultimately we're all screwed. And so the, it, it, I think we we have to expand expand our our lens of safety to include uh, the other people we share this world with. Um, and so I think that's why Arkimoto has made a different trade off in the realm of safety than those who are developing full size cars and also those who are developing two-wheeled scooters and motorcycles. We've just chosen our own path. Mm -hmm. But cool. I, I, would love, I, would, I would certainly love to have um, Tesla's safety engineering team take absolutely everything that they have learned uh, building the world's safest cars and say, you know, here's what you should do uh, to make this vehicle better. That would be awesome. Um, I, I don't expect that to happen. What I, what, what I guess my real ask of Tesla is, is sell us some of those sweet, sweet 4680 cells, please, because they are amazing in all ways. Um, so I had, I had a technical question and then I had a more business philosophical question. So I'll start with the technical question, which is, um, let's say theoretically that if you wanted to add a third person, added like one more extra sheet, I imagine that you could just expand that battery capacity as well to match that needs. Um, would you would would you overall like gain the amount of kilowatt hours or the amount of miles traveled uh, like per person if you were to do that without thinking about like the dynamics of the system? So so like make the the, the stretch version. Yeah. I, that, yeah. That, that would certainly be one way that you could add another person. Uh, you could also make the back seat a bench seat um, to get two people in the back. Uh, I think on the Roadster, we will almost certainly see um, that a third or fourth in some locales, maybe a fifth person would sit on that. I mean, if you look at um, people in Vietnam riding whole families on two-wheeled motorcycles, uh, you, you could certainly fit. Uh, a, 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 the, the, this platform can carry, uh, can certainly carry the weight. Um, so, but, but we haven't really focused on that. Um, you know, again, like we're, we've just looked very carefully at how people use cars. And it's almost always one and two people traveling a very short distance with a small amount of stuff. So the, the effort of Arkimoto is to really solve that problem very well um, and then you know, leave the other 20% of the problem for everybody else. Makes sense. Um, that makes sense. So then the, the philosophical idea was, um, and so for you, you were able to make the switch from soft tech to hard tech, like you said, which is, which is incredible, right? I think that a lot of people right now, I mean, everyone is a student here, you know, here, you know. And I, I, so, so what I would say is I didn't really make the, so I, I did make the switch from building software to building hardware, but the real switch was going from programming with C to programming with money and people. And that was, that was what was really, really hard. Um, because in, in the garage games world, I could solve all of the tough problems. If there was a difficult programming engineering problem um, and, and nobody else on the team could solve it, that was what I had spent my whole life 
figuring out how to do. And it didn't set me up very well to be a good collaborator on something I had no idea how to pull off. So the real hard part of Arkimoto for me personally has been um, really adjusting my persona to be able to work with a team of people and point them in the same direction uh, to, to mutual benefit. Right, right, that makes sense. I don't know if that so, was what you were ultimately philosophically getting at, but just to set the record straight there, that, that was the hard part. Now, can I, I can imagine that it's probably more of an art than a science. Um, well, I guess what I was trying to get more pointedly at was, um, or more specifically at was, and I guess Jack and Scott, you guys can probably answer this as well if you feel um, determined. But um, for like someone, like I can only use myself as an example, who it's like, your, like my trajectory right now does not necessarily have this time of like doing entrepreneurship or of like starting a product out of the gates, right? Like I want to go to grad school um, as like a basis. So like, is there a realm of where you can generate these ideas and like give them to people to do for startups? Like, is there a way to sell ideas that you know of? Like if uh -huh. I don't want to go and build my own EV, but I want somebody else to, because I think it'd be sweet if I could eventually drive one of those. Like, how do you do that? Uh, you know, I, I think that was kind of my idea at the beginning was I was, I was actually, and when I, when I started Arkimoto, that I, was, I wasn't actually going to be in Arkimoto. I didn't actually, I, I sort of was funding it. I was funding people to go and, and sort of start, you know, kind of develop my, my idea or in the direction of an idea. Um, but, but ultimately, I mean, what, what, what was required for it to succeed was for me to roll up my sleeves and jump in and actually work on it. Because it, it is very rare that your first idea of what will be the win will actually be the win. Sometimes you get it, you know, it's like sometimes you're, you're, you write the program, 500 lines of code, you hit compile, and it actually works the, full, the first time. A lot of the time it has a syntax error and actually that, you know, a pointer overflow, and then you've got to go and actually fix the bugs. And, and th those can be bugs in the implementation or they, they can be bugs in the basic idea. And it, we had seven years of both just to get to the right idea. Uh, and then, you know, five more years after that to, uh, um, to, to actually get into production. And I, I, I guarantee it, was, it wasn't just the, oh, hey, it'd be cool to do a three-wheel vehicle. Um, that was the, the idea, the, the, real, um, the real getting there was getting the team together and keeping them aimed all in the right direction to get to the prize. Um, so I would say for, if you, if you're, if you're interested in startup ideas, there's a, um, you, you can certainly participate in things like on Reddit, there's a, a DIY channel that, that people working on cool projects, you can throw ideas out there for people to do, see what sticks, um, and, and just be a part of that kind of creative movement. There's all the maker, uh, fairs and, and kind of maker movements going on all over the place that you can plug into and get involved with without having to you know, start a company to do it, but you can definitely do idea, uh, ideation and innovation um, as a hobby. And I would definitely encourage you to do it because through that process, you may end up coming to something that you really want to actually take, uh, take into commercialization, which would be fun. Thank you. Jack or Scott, do you guys have any input on that one as well? Well, uh, uh, to be honest with you, I missed part of the question uh, and, 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 the, and the answer because I had to run to the restroom. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, I always advise people that who want to do a startup. I think Mark, uh, you know, being successful in his video game business, just go to work for a company first and learn the ropes. And, uh, and then you can do your startup. That's my advice. So what if you wanted to sell an idea and you yourself not have the time to work on it? Is that possible? Why wouldn't you have the time to work on your own idea? Because I don't know, like school. I want to go to grad school and do material science, but at the same time, um, you know. You know, you, uh, Mark, you did bring up an interesting point, Sandhill. You know, I struggled, we struggled there too. Uh, I worked at, at Activision and we sold our business to, to um, 
uh, to Activision. I worked there after I sold it. But anyways, make a long story short, we couldn't get funding at all because it was hardware. And uh, they, the Sandhill guys, um, nice guys, uh, Andreessen Horowitz, those guys are great. They just invest in software. That's what they get. And and with a few exceptions, I mean, there, of course, there's Tesla. But um, that that's the difficulty we had was getting funding. And this was a uh, $2 billion franchise later on. It turned out to be very big. It was just very tough to get funding for hardware. Um, and I advise people to focus, uh, you know, if you want to get funding, you make the software the play. Uh, that's kind of what we did. Um, and I just, I just, I don't really do the whole um, investing and recruiting venture capital people types, you know, venture capital investors, other people do that. It's not my area, uh, but I watched them very carefully to see what they did and how they interacted and, uh, and it's all important stuff, but I don't know, Mark, was your experience, you said you had, didn't have much luck with the Sand Hill people. Well, I, yeah, and, and part of it was that we, we bootstrapped garage games. So we all, we each kicked in 10 grand, four of us when we started and never took a, a dime of additional investment. So that left me, you know, sort of woefully unprepared for any kind of fundraising. Uh, if you look at videos of my early pitches, they are atrociously bad. Um, and it and just, you know, so, so it, it was no wonder that um, I never managed to. Yeah, you know, I actually are. Uh, we, we didn't get actual venture capital until the spring of 2015 and started going after our Series A in 2009. So Ted Wang, who is our, our lawyer at Fenwick, um, said basically, um, if, if, uh, if you actually close this round, um, you will have the longest running, open, successful Series A in the history of Fenwick and West. Um, and we actually did manage to pull that off. So um, it, it uh, but, but I think that's, that's partly just because when I, when I started going out there, it was it was the worst possible timing, um, and when I uh, uh, and I was I was definitely completely unprepared for it. All right, I see two more students with questions. I think we can get through it before the the hour and we end. Uh, Brittany. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to put my hand down. I was going to ask about safety, but my question was answered. Um, thank you for the presentation, though. My pleasure. Yeah, and if you want to learn more on the safety front, you can just go to arkhamoto.com/safety walks through okay, our full so safety model. On that safety discussion, I'll just comment that uh, that story, Mark, uh, it, it disappoints me that um, the influence of tweets uh, from, you know, be a president of the United States or CEO of a big company can influence, you know, an entire part of society as if it's fact. Uh, and I was laughingly thinking to myself, maybe I should write a research publication where all the references are just tweets people say. <laughs> See how that works in the peer review process. Yeah, totally. Well, and, and I, you know, I think everyone comes at this from their own perspective. You know, um, um, and I, I don't begrudge uh, Elon his perspective at all. I think it's you know that uh, being building the world's safest cars is part of their ethos, uh, and so and we are definitely building something that is not a car. It is not a 4,000 pound machine. Um, and you are at a big disadvantage if you go toe to toe with an SUV and an Arkhamoto. There's no question about that. So, um, but I, I think we look at it, uh, again, we look at it through, through, a, through a different lens. It has to do with how much asphalt of our cities we dedicate to big cars and um, how much raw material we want to use for every vehicle out there. Uh, and it doesn't, meet the uh, the typical idea of you know the 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 mom the soccer mom's Volvo it's just it's just a different way of looking at it definitely all right Amy yeah thank you Mark for giving us like a really great overview of Akimoto and kind of your history um my question kind of pertains to your journey can you tell us a little bit about your work ethic and what do you think led you to ultimately succeed, even if it took six years Series A? Uh, so, so on the on the work ethic side, I've never been accused of actually having a really solid work ethic, um, uh, and and I think that that's 
partly because I'm super ADD and I'm interested in lots of different things. So I, I think what I, even though now I'm, I'm sort of like work continuously, um, it's all on things that I love and I'm very engaged by and very interested in. Um, and for, for Arkimoto, I think what has been you know, sort of a persona asset that has allowed us to uh, you know, continue through, I mean, just you know, running out of cash multiple times throughout the history of the company, uh, just repeated uh, psyche blows from every single potential funder that said no along the way, um, was just a real conviction that what we were doing was ultimately worth doing. And that part of the reason why the thing that I was looking for didn't exist is because nobody had really pushed through to make it get into the world. Um, now that it's in the world and people can look at it and drive it and they're like, fuck yeah, this thing's great. I love it. It's super fun. Um, it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to tell that story when it's already there. But before we got there, it really just required... Uh, just, a, a, I think, a real stubbornness. Um, I, I hate to lose. Uh, I've, as a gamer, I just, I hate to lose. I hate to give up. I've never, you know, I, I play games out till the bitter end, even when the writing's on the wall, because sometimes when you're playing, your opponent will make a mistake, and then you actually, you know, snatch uh, victory from the jaws of defeat. And I think that's, that, that characteristic um, probably above all else is what has allowed Arkimoto to get to where it is today, at least from my, my participation in it. Thank you. We will make sure to do the same. We'll make sure to grab victory from the jaws of defeat. <laughs> and, and, and also <laughs> just, are yeah, and, and just, you know, and my, my only real exhortation to you would be when you're, when you're working on, when you jump in on entrepreneurial projects or anything, just make sure it's something that you really care about uh, because that, that will carry you through the really tough spots. If you, if you don't really believe in what you're doing, um, then when the going gets really tough, you'll bail. And that's just, it's natural. There's nothing wrong with it. But if you're working on something that you are truly passionate about that really gets you up in the morning, then it, 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 it'll make you go the extra mile. No doubt. Uh, wonderful. Well, uh, Mark, uh, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Uh, the, this class in particular, I find the students are incredibly active and engaged. And there's no doubt in my mind that although you can't see all their faces, they are latched to every single word uh, that you have to say. And the power of your example, um, and also you know, relating to you as a Cal alum, I think uh, no doubt inspires these students to do uh, you know, great things. So you could be doing a lot of things right now. And I really uh, respect and appreciate that. But, you know, being with the students and us, uh, I'm just so grateful. So thank you. Well, well, well I, I, I will echo that. I think, you know, thank you all for uh, uh, hanging in and for the, the, the very on point questions. Really appreciate the opportunity. Um, one thing that's one silver lining of COVID is it's taken all of the transportation time out of the equation. So I actually have a lot more time now to do, I mean, this is basically what I, where I sit and do earnings calls and every investor meeting and team meetings and uh, fun discussions with, uh, with the future. So really appreciate your time. Wonderful. And this brings us to the end of the course until the Jacobs Showcase. Uh, Thanks, Mark. Yeah, let's give, give Mark a hand. My pleasure. We um, also, I want to give a special thanks to Jack uh, for this course. Uh, we wouldn't be here if it weren't uh, for him and him uh, coming to campus and saying, hey, you know, let's do a fun course with students on, on electric vehicles. So thank you, Jack. Let's all give him a hand. Way to go, Jack. I had a blast. Hope to do more of it, maybe. All right, folks, we will see you next Thursday. Take care, everybody. Great to meet you guys. Thanks again, Scott. See you guys. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, guys. Thank you.